Good morning. Thanks for joining us today for the August 2022 SEAC webinar. I'm Susan Four, and along with William Greenhalgh and David Bettino, we are going to be your hosts this morning. This event is being recorded. For closed captioning, please click on that link in the chat feature. Okay, so today you'll be hearing about some of our latest updates on programs and policies related to um, your work with CalPERS. The presentation will take about two and a half hours, which includes a 10 minute break. There will be questions following each presentation and then again at the general roundtable at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. So we do have a few housekeeping items. As I mentioned, this is being recorded and it will be available on the CalPERS website next week. All attendees mics are muted. And today's meeting materials are available on our CalPERS SEAC webpage. But if you have any problems locating those materials, feel free to email the SEAC mailbox. We'll be sure to get those to you. The SEAC mailbox is calpers underscore SEAC at calpers.ca.gov. Next slide, please. In addition to submitting your question in the Q&A box, you can use the raised hand feature. You can do this by clicking that little raised hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Our host will then unmute you and then you can ask your question. Please don't forget to mute your mic after you've asked your question. Thanks. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we've gathered multiple CalPERS leaders and team members for this webinar. Andrea Peters will give us a legislative update. Brad Hansen will provide information regarding school pay rates. Then Steve McKee from our Office of Audit Services will follow that up with an overview of the employer reviews. Heather Porter is here to update us on post-retirement employment determinations, as well as a Social Security Administrator update. Then we're going to take a 10-minute break. This time we've included a little trivia challenge just for fun for breaks, so feel free to play along. Next slide. So after break, Megan Corti will provide an update on some of my CalPERS system enhancements. Lindsay Dahl will tell us about technical resources available to our school employers. Josh Robinson from Stakeholder Relations will share information about the Ed Form coming up in November. And finally, a couple of our assistant chiefs from the Employer Account Management Division, Brad Hansen and Christina Rollins, they're here to lead us on a question and answer session at the end. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Andrea. Next slide, please. There you go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrea Peters, and I will be providing you today's legislative update. We will be providing updates to the four bills that we discussed in May. Those bills were Senate Bill 1173, Senate Bill 1328, Senate Bill 1343, and Senate Bill 1402. This morning, attendees received a PDF document titled CalPERS Bill List. This document contains summaries of the bills that CalPERS is actively monitoring, including the bills that I plan to discuss today. Also, in the chat box, there is a link that will take attendees to a similar bill list that is available online that updates real time. Here, you will be able to access some of the bills that we are currently reviewing. When you click on the link, it will take you to the CalPERS legislation website. Under the heading, Current Legislation, there are two options, one titled State and the other titled Federal. Attendees will want to select the State option. The State link will direct attendees to a third-party website called Capital Track. This website provides a list of bills that CalPERS is actively monitoring in a slightly different format than the PDF we provided today. When the attendee clicks on a bill number, for example, Senate Bill 1343, the attendee will be provided more information about the bill, such as a high level summary of the bill, where the bill is in the legislative process, and what actions, if any, have been taken on the bill. This information is updated real time 
and is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I would recommend saving the link for future reference, and we will be sure to send out the link in an email following today's meeting. Again, you can find the information about the link and the bills that we are covering today in the chat box. Those bills, once again, are Senate Bill 1173, Senate Bill 1328, Senate Bill 1343, and Senate Bill 1402. Let's begin. Senate Bill 1173 prohibited the CalPERS and CalSTRS boards from making new investments in fossil fuel companies and required both systems to divest existing fossil fuel company investments on or before July 1st, 2030, if it was consistent with CalPERS fiduciary duty. Also, beginning on February 1st, 2024, and annually thereafter, Senate Bill 1173 would have required each board to submit a report to the governor and legislature regarding any fossil fuel company holdings and divestments. At its April board meeting, the CalPERS board adopted an opposed position on Senate Bill 1173 because it imposed a divestment mandate which compromised CalPERS investment strategies by eliminating alternatives from the investment opportunity set and reducing diversification, which has a detrimental effect on investment returns over the long term. Senate Bill 1173 failed to meet its second policy committee deadline and will not be moving forward this year. Our next bill is Senate Bill 1328. Specifically, as it pertained to CalPERS and its operations, this bill was amended to prohibit the board of any public retirement system from investing public employee retirement funds in a company domiciled in Russia or Belarus, any company owned by a person sanctioned as a result of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, any company determined to be complicit and the Russian aggression against Ukraine, or any company that provides military equipment to Russia or Belarus. It also required the boards to file an annual report regarding this divestment with the legislature beginning on or before January 1st, 2023. CalPERS continues to stand in solidarity with the citizens and country of Ukraine and addressing our investments in Russia remains a top priority for CalPERS. Nevertheless, the current sanctions and market restrictions continue to place significant constraints on our ability to liquidate our Russian holdings. A prior version of Senate Bill 1328 sought to impose divestment mandates that extended well beyond sanctions imposed by the federal government and would have impacted approximately $185 billion of our current investment portfolio. For this reason, the CalPERS board adopted an opposed position on Senate Bill 1328. Senate Bill 1328 also failed to meet its second policy committee deadline and will not be moving forward this year. Our next bill is Senate Bill 1343. This bill would require charter schools authorized on and after January 1st, 2023 to participate in CalPERS and CalSTRS in the same manner as other public schools, unless participation would incur adverse tax consequences under the Federal Internal Revenue Code. This bill will not apply to charter schools seeking a renewal authorization on or after January 1st, 2023, if the charter school initially received authorization to commence operations before January 1st, 2023, and has continuously operated as a charter school since the initial authorization. The CalPERS board has not taken a position on this bill. 
Senate Bill 1343 is scheduled to be heard in the Assembly Appropriations Committee today. Our final bill is Senate Bill 1402. This bill would expand eligibility for service credit purchase for military service prior to membership to include active service in the Merchant Marine of the United States on and after January 1st, 1950. For public agencies, this provision of law would no longer be a contracted benefit, but a mandated benefit instead. This would impact approximately 39 public agencies. All other public agencies currently contract for this benefit. For state and school employers, this bill removes eligibility date requirements from existing law. Currently, Merchant Marine Service must have been performed prior to January 1st, 1950. This bill would allow members to purchase Merchant Marine Service performed on and after January 1st, 1950. The CalPERS Board has not taken a position on this bill. Senate Bill 1402 is also scheduled to be heard today in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. This concludes my presentation. With that, Suzanne, do we have any live questions that I can answer? Hi, I am checking for that right now and not at this time. Nope. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your time. I will now turn the presentation over to Brad Hansen in the Employer Account Management Division. Greetings. How's everyone doing today? Well, I can't really see any of you, but I assume everyone's having a great day and they're giving me the thumbs up and a big smile. All right, so today we are going to talk about an issue that we've discussed um, a, a few times over the past year. It has to do with how school pay rates should be reported to CalPERS on a full-time basis. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, the government code that supports how the pay rate should be reported is under 20636.1B1. And essentially what it says is that full-time employment for school employees is 40 hours per week, regardless of their schedule. And you should report the base pay rate on a 40 hour equivalent of the hourly pay rate. So basically like we know a lot of schools truly have 37 hour positions, 38 hour positions, you know, anywhere between 36 and 40. Um, unlike our public agencies or state members, schools have this special provision within 20636.1 that says that the pay rate should always be based on 40. So in order to ensure that the member is truly getting their pay rate based on the 40-hour conversion, we need to ensure that's reported the way that I'm about to show you. So if you would, please, next slide. So before we dive into that, there's another government code 20962, which talks about what full-time service credit is. And this applies to all CalPERS employers. So full-time service credit equates to 10 full-time months, uh, 215 days, or 1,720 hours. And the way that you calculate service credit is you divide the earnings, the amount of, of money that the person actually earned during the time they worked for that fiscal year, divided by their full-time pay rate, and that's what calculates a service credit. And that's one of the reasons why we also need the pay rate to be accurate, because if a member is working, say, 37 hours, true, you may consider that full-time, but for service credit purposes, you need to work those full 40 hours to get that full week of service credit. So the pay rate has to be based on 40, and the earnings have to be what they truly earned. Okay, now let's dive into the example. Next slide, please. So this is what we're going to build our two examples on. This is the base of it. I'm going to give you an example, an incorrect example, and then I'm going to give you a correct example. And then at the end, I'll show you the difference in what the member would earn had their pay rates been reported the appropriate way based off the government code. So for our example here, um, you can see the full-time employee actually works 225 days, which equates to 7.5 hours per day their annual earnings is $120,000. So that's what they earn for that entire year based on those 7.5 hours. Their daily earnings, every day they earn $533.33. Um, and, and 
the way you come up with that is you take the annual earnings, divide that by the day, days, and you could see that that's what they earn per day. And then the hourly pay rate is that amount they earn per day multiplied by the amount of hours they work. So their hourly rate is $71.11 per hour. Okay, so this is the base that we're going to use to build both of our examples. This all right here is accurate. This is how these things should be calculated. Okay, next um, slide, please. So here's the incorrect example. So in this case, this school, they took, um, they just took the full amount of the earnings, one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and they divided it by the month's work, twelve, and the monthly pay rate came out to a ten thousand dollar pay rate. So the problem with this example is if, if it was reported in such a way, you'd see the earnings match the pay rate and the person ends up getting a full month every month. Um, so, you know, 0.1 times 12, that's the amount of months they work, they get 1.2 service credit. Of course, we cap at one year. So the person got that full year. And should you go forward with this type of, of calculation, um, we're, we're saying that they were at the two at 55 classic formula and they had 20 years of service. So they get 40% of their final comp for their retirement allowance. And you could see based on that $10,000 final comp, that's their pay rate averaged over 12 months, they come up with a $4,000 unmodified allowance, which is the highest allowance you could receive. So again, there's issues with this because basically you're just matching the pay rate to the earnings. The pay rate's not based off of 40, like I mentioned earlier. The earnings are correct, but because it was based off 37 points, Five, you can see the person is getting their full service credit and their final comp is going to be lower than what we expect. Okay, so that's the bad example. Here is the good example. Next slide, please. Okay, so this school, they they actually followed the, the instructions and how, or the government code, I should say, and how to do this. So remember, we had our base and we figured out how to um, calculate what the hourly pay rate was. It was $71.11. So to to come up with the monthly pay rate, you take that hourly, the 7111, and you multiply it by the full-time hours. Full-time hours in, is in reality for 40 is 2,080 2, hours. So multiply those two numbers together, you get come up with this yearly uh, annual amount of $154,793.60 per year, and then you divide that by 12. And that's how you should calculate what their monthly pay rate is. So you can see it's significantly higher. Now we know that the person didn't really get paid this 154,000 and that will actually come, come out when we do the calculation for service credit, but for final comp purposes for their pay rate issue it has to be based on this because 40 is what's considered full-time. So the service credit they earn per month won't be a full month, it will be point. 0811, you can see the calculation below. The earnings, again, the true earnings, what they really earned was $10,000. Divide that by that monthly pay rate, and you can see that's how we came up with that calculation for service credit. In this scenario, the person actually earns a little bit less than a year in a fiscal year. You can see here that they earned the 0 0.0811, they worked 12 months, and it came up a little bit short. It came up about 0 0.0268 off. And I'll tell you just from my experience in calculations, the difference between one month and, and that small amount doesn't really amount to a hill of beans when it comes to a calculation for retirement. You know, you could see some slight changes over the years if someone continued to not earn the full, for full year, but it really doesn't equate to too much of a difference. So now we run it through our retirement calculator. And you can see we base it on, again, the classic formula. The person's got 2% at 20 years, 40%. So you take that, uh, 40% of the $12,325.93. And the new allowance comes out to $4,798.24. So again, this pay rate was based on if the person was 40, even though they weren't 40, the earnings stayed the same, their service credit was impacted, but their final comp was increased. So it kind of evens that out. Okay, so the amount was much higher. Let's go to the next screen so I can show you a side-by-side -side comparison. So you can see here with the incorrect example, the member's allowance came out to $4,000, but with the correct calculation, it actually came out about $700, $800 higher. So um, it's important that these pay rates are based on 40 because as you can see, the members can be really shortchanged in their allowance should, should their calculation not be um, done accurately. All right, next slide, please. 
Okay, so that's all I have on this pay rate um, issue. I do want to mention we're currently drafting a circular letter that captures all of these details. We're targeting and send it out within the next few months. I actually have a draft at my desk right now. Um, so we're hoping to have that out by no later than the education forum. Um, and then if you ever want us to review a pay schedule um, or have questions on this, you can always send us an inquiry at our MOU review mailbox, which is MOU underscore review at calpers.ca.gov. And uh, we'd be glad to take a look at, at that for you and help you work through your um, issues with the pay rate calculations. Okay, um, Susan, do we have any live questions? No raised hands at this time. Um, if you just want to wait for just another few seconds, sometimes it takes a minute for them to yep. think of their question. No worries. And I know we've talked about this at a lot of our webinars in the past too. It's just a good, it's a really good reminder because I know that this is something that was recently audited and we still had quite a few findings based off this issue. Okay, Tina, go ahead, Tina. You can unmute yourself. You're still muted. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. So on page number 12, when I see you do the calculation, um, hourly 71, 11 times 20, 80 hour, you come up with 140, 154,793, I don't get that number. Okay, let me see here on page, which page 11? Number, uh, no, page number 12. Page 12, okay. When you try to come up with the monthly pay rate, and you take the hourly rate of 7111 times 20, 80 hours, you get um, 154,000. Oh, I think you're talking about the other slide, Susan, sorry. Go to the next, uh, my slide is different, okay. okay. There we go. There you go, yeah, that's the All one. All right, let's see here, 7111 uh -huh. uh -huh. times 20, 80. 80 yeah. Comes 147,908.8. Yeah. Oh. So if you divide by 12, you don't get the monthly that you have it there. So uh, <laughs> that's well, why. Sorry, you know what? I, I just I, I just need to update the slide. You know what? The, you're correct. But when I did the math, it actually does come out to that amount. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. You you do you does come up with the correct monthly. Yes, yes. Yep. That's sorry. Right. Okay. So, I'm kind of stuck right no, there, so I couldn't go further. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> you you have a keen eye and a great mind for math. And I apologize for that. We did we've kind of tinkered with our slides and I think I just forgot to update that part. But okay. But when I play it all out, so 7111 okay. times 2080 comes out to $147,908.80. Mm -hmm. And then if you divide that by 12, it comes up with that. 12, okay, yeah, so, yeah. The rest of calculation is correct, though. Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you. No problem. Hey, good eye for that. We're going to fix that for the next time and see if we'll have it next at the end of our right. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yep, she was right. But it's still, at the end of the day, it, 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 you can see that that was the true pay rate. So that's the main point. Any other um, questions? No raised hands. Excellent. Okay, well, um, thanks a lot. I'm gonna, um, I, I don't remember who's up after me, but I'm gonna pass it on to that person. Um, all right, I'll see you guys at the end. Thank you very much, bye. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Steve McKee. I'm with the Office of Audit Services and the Employer Compliance Review section of that office. And I will be discussing an audit or review that was conducted um, the title of that review was Pay Schedules and Pay Rates School Employers Review. And I want to just start by a slight disclaimer that uh, I was not the manager that oversaw that cycle. That manager has since moved on. And whereas his expertise uh, may not rise to the level of Brad's, he is much more, meaning the manager that oversaw this cycle, much more the expert than I. I shall, I just have the good pleasure of presenting the highlights. So uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about the Office of Audit Services. We uh, conduct public agency and school reviews. 
to assess compliance with the Public Employees Retirement Law. And that, again, is the employer compliance review side of the Office of Audit Services. We also have an internal audit side, which audits CalPERS processes. So again, our uh, the audit that we'll be discussing or the review cycle that we'll be discussing, pay schedules and pay rates, school employers review. It was part of the board approved audit plan for the fiscal year 2020 through 2021. And the report on that review was released in December of 2021. Next slide, please. Okay, so we always, in the audit realm, we speak of our objective and our scope, and uh, we frame our objective, our, our objective being our focus, narrow focus, so that we can be as efficient as possible and take as little time of our employers as possible. We do so-called scope down our reviews, and we keep a, a really tight focus on our objective. And uh, so, and our objective is always based on a criteria, which is our government code and our California Code of Regulations section that pertains to our, our limited focus that we, we, we take. So our objective, uh, two parts, as Brad mentioned about pay rates, um, we selected a sample of 60 school employers and we reviewed their pay schedules and their, their pay rates to verify compliance with, and we have here our criteria, government code section, which Brad mentioned, 20636.1 B1 and D. Um, sorry, if you'd go back to that slide. There we go. And uh, the net, of course, that's an indicator that I'm taking too long. I'm talking too much, so I'm going <laughs> to keep that in mind. Uh, Title II, California Code of Regulations, Section 570.5. Little humor there. I know it's kind of early, um, but we have some humor here. Uh, okay, so again, our objective is pay schedules and reported pay rates. We want to see whether they represent the correct full-time uh, pay based on 40 hours per week for 52 weeks for, for classic classified members. So the classified employees. We selected a sample of 60 school employers. Our review period was January 1, 2016 through December 31, 2020. Next slide, please. Okay, in just a moment. There we go. So a couple definitions. Again, this is our criteria on which we performed our review. In our government code section 20636, we define pay rate as the normal monthly rate of pay or base pay paid in cash for services rendered on a full-time basis during normal working hours pursuant to a publicly available pay schedule. And then for classified members, which again, on, for this review, we focused on classified members, school employees, the full-time rate is 40 hours based on 40 hours per week, payment for services rendered not to exceed 40 hours per week, and shall be reported as compensation earnable for all months of the year in which work is performed. Next slide, please. The next part of our criteria, we, we look at the California Code of Regulations, Section 570.5. And this section gives requirements of those publicly available pay schedules. And it lists a number of criteria. Examples of those criteria are the pay schedule must be duly approved by the, the employer's governing body. The pay schedule has to be publicly available. It needs to identify uh, position titles for every employee position, and it needs to indicate the time, base, et cetera. There are a number of criteria. And so our review looked at all of those criteria as a basis for reviewing each employer's pay schedule. And then uh, we have the statement that's from our, our criteria section here. Pay rates shall be limited to the amount listed on the pay schedule. Next slide, please. So moving on to, we've discussed our objective, our scope, our criteria, moving on to a summary of the results of the review, where, whereby our auditors went out and, and reviewed the uh, 60 employers, school employers. 
what was identified overall, um, 58 out of 60 school employers, we had some issues noted, and they broke down into two areas. Uh, employers did not have pay schedules that met the requirements of that section that we just discussed, the California Code of Rec Regulations section. And we also had an area of, we noted that employers did not report pay rates that complied with our government code section criteria, as well as where it is touched upon in, in California Code of Regulations uh, 570.5. Next slide, please. So breaking out those uh, two main subject areas or our objectives, pay schedule observations. Uh, the first, we had 52 school employers whose pay schedules were not compliant with our statutes, our relevant statutes. statutes. So what we noted, pay schedules, and here's some of the uh, issues noted, were not properly approved by the superintendent of school districts, county office of education, board of education. We noted pay schedules for among those 52 employers, uh, there were a number that did not include position titles for all employee positions. We noted pay schedules did not identify the full-time pay rate for each identified position. Uh, we noted that an instance of referencing another document, so we noted that pay schedules referenced another document in lieu of disclosing the pay rate. Some instances where that occurred. And we also noted instances among that 52 where the pay schedule did not identify an effective date or revision date if a revision had occurred. Next slide, please. Now we move on to the area of observations noted that pertain directly to pay rates. So we're moving on from the pay schedule observation area onto the pay rate area. And we noted 26 school employers reported pay rates that not, did not reflect a full-time pay rate as Brad uh, discussed. So what we noted was in these instances, reported pay rates uh, incorrectly reported earnings based on the number of contracted days in an academic year versus the 2080 days, which reflects 40 hours a week, 52 weeks per year, as Brad noted. And so in summary uh, of this area, the, the proper reporting is that reported pay rates should reflect earnings based on 40 hours per week for 52 weeks per year. So we had 26 school employers that had uh, pay rate observations, if you will. Next slide, please. And then we noted 19 school employers where pay rates included additional compensation. So, for example, uh, pay rate, just refreshing our memory, is defined in our statutes as the normal monthly pay rate or the normal monthly rate of pay or base pay paid in cash for services rendered on a full-time basis during normal uh, working hours pursuant to a publicly available pay schedule. So that's normal monthly rate of pay or base pay. What we noted was that there were instances where the reported pay rates in, incorrectly included additional compensation, uh, such as what we noted was there, were, there was inclusion of post-retirement health benefits amounts. There was inclusion of, for example, professional growth stipends, also inclusion of overtime, and a couple instances of inclusion of longevity pay in the pay rate which as we know, that should be composed solely of the monthly rate of pay or base pay. And so in summary of that area, we had 19 school employers that, were, that had additional compensation reported in pay rate. Pay rate should be the base pay and not include any items of additional compensation. Next slide, please. So now we look at just an overview of what can happen or what are the possible impacts of non-compliance in these areas. So it can impact employer contributions amounts. It can lead to miscalculations of those amounts that are due. It can result, non-compliance in these areas can result in delays of processing of member retirement benefits. 
It can result in inaccurate retirement estimates. So when the member is planning their retirement, they go on to MyCalPERS, they look at a, a calculation to estimate what income they will have. It can result, noncompliance in these areas can result in incorrect uh, retirement estimates being provided to the member, which can impact their planning adversely, potentially. It can result in incorrect payment of benefits to the retiree, which can then our next area result in benefit reductions that the retiree member, retired member might have to sustain, which, which are not favorable. And it can also result in increased employer administrative costs for processing of corrections. So um, compliance in these areas always as always important. Next slide, please. And so do we have any, any questions at this point? Uh, we have no raised hands. Okay. I thought for a minute, maybe I hadn't unmuted my mic, uh, <laughs> which would be tragic, wouldn't it? Okay. So at this point, if there are no questions. I will hand it over to Heather Porter. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Good morning. Um, as Steve mentioned, my name is Heather Porter. I'm a section manager over the membership and post-retirement determinations team, as well as the state social security administrators team. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I would like to communicate um, some new direction that CalPERS began implementing in June regarding who we will consider as the governing body for a school. When reviewing resolutions for 180 day waivers and vacant positions, we will allow a school board um, at the district level to be the acceptable governing body. The 180 day waiver must still be approved by the employer's governing body in a public meeting and must be approved as an action item rather than on a consent calendar. So we will be sending out an overarching circular letter. Um, this should be released soon. It's not only going to communicate this message, but it will also be a thorough review of all post-retirement requirements and limitations. It's going to be a bit of a refresher since there has been so much going on with executive orders in the past few years um, with additional waivers and such. So um, this will be a nice refresher overview of all the requirements and limitations. So at this point, I'm going to ask if there's any questions regarding this new direction that we can address. Um, we do have a raised hand. I'm wondering, though, if that was for Steve, because it came on just as you came on. I'm going to ask Nancy to go ahead and unmute herself and ask her question. We'll see what we can do. Thank you, uh, because I, I put it in the Q&A. And it was responded with that it's going to be answered live. So my question was, how far back should we have salary scheduled to be publicly available? Are there any options? And it's for Steve. Uh, actually, yeah. So I'm the one that accidentally hit live. Um, I answered it in the chat. Um, but per the per the California Code of Regulations, um, it's number seven under 570.5. It has to be retained for a minimum of five years. That's the only option that you really have, five years or more. Okay. Now, because uh, I, I do not work in HR, I work in payroll, but I do not see that being publicly available on the website. Is that okay? Is is upon inquiry, we can then share the five years? Is that true? Correct. It does not have to be on the website. We prefer it all to be on the website because it makes our reviews much easier because we mm, can just mm, pull it up. Yeah. However, it just has to be readily publicly available at your HR counter or wherever you keep your pay schedule. So if a, team, if a person that works for your school district, they want to see the pay schedule, you should have it readily available and maintained mm. up to five years minimum. Got it. Got it. Sometimes it's challenging for payroll because sometimes we have to do retroactive payments and we don't have those salary schedules available. So it's, uh, I'll, I'll do my little internal <laughs> avocation. <laughs> just, can, yeah. can we have the, the five years that will help helpers help us in right too. Yeah. But that would be a guaranteed audit finding if it wasn't publicly available, just to give you a heads up. <laughs> yeah, they have the current one, right? Okay. Yeah, they do have the current one. It's not none, it's the current one. Okay. But, yeah, if we then need to go back prior fiscal year, a couple of them that it's uh, there's a rate change that, uh, yeah, it, it's not there, but even though we do have it internally in our 
in our system that we can probably pull up. But yeah, so on the website, uh, just the, the most recent one. Okay. okay. Anyway, All right. Thank you, Brad. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Susan, are there any questions regarding um, this slide? If not, we can move on to the next um, slide. It looks like we might have some more. Okay. Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, is that Jennifer? Yes, um, it is Jennifer. I, I just wanted to know, um, so according to this slide, then the governing um, body of the school board is the only one that has to approve it, or does it still have to go through the COE's um, board to approve too? Just, so oh, that's, that's the new direction is that it's going to just be at the district level as far as CalPERS is requiring. So um, before we would require it to go through the COE and we are not requiring that anymore. We're requiring at the district level that okay. will be approved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ram Ramona, go ahead. Heather, even though the district is the one that's um, the only one approving, it still has to be submitted through the county office, correct, to CalPERS? No, we won't be requiring that anymore. If you, if the county office wants to have an internal process with their districts to do something like that so that they're aware and they're kept in the loop, that would be between the districts and the county office. Uh, we're, we're trying to add efficiencies and also we've reviewed best practices of this with um, other departments such as CalSTRS and what they will approve. And that's kind of how we've come to this determination that we will allow at the district level. So again, if the county office still wants to um, have knowledge and be included, that would be an internal process between the two of them. Okay, thank you. Okay, we did have another hand raised, but it went away. So I'm thinking maybe that um, her question was answered. If not, go ahead and raise your hand again and we'll take care of it. But in the meantime, I think we can move on. Okay. So then we'll go on to the next slide. So as you all know, the executive orders have ended. And I just wanted to remind anyone who realized after the fact that they hadn't reported or sent the proper waivers um, that our team can assist you. Please just send an email to our working after retirement inbox and the team will work with you on the next steps for those. So um, just wanted to remind everybody of that. And there's our inbox there if you need to note it down. Next slide, please. Okay, so before I move on to my social security updates, does anyone have any other questions um, that I can assist with? Still no more hands. Oh, okay. oh, oh, hold oh. on, one just came out. <laughs> Go ahead, Tina. Oh. Hi, this like is Janelle. Janelle, okay. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this at the beginning. Is there going to be a circular letter coming out soon regarding the change to the 180 day waiver process? Yes, there's going to be an overarching, like very thorough circular letter regarding um, working after retirement, post retirement employment restrictions, limitations, and this will be included in within that as the um, as it was called out prior. I believe that you know they would only be um, allowed at the the governing body was the county office. Now it will state that the governing body can be at the district level. Is that going to be coming really soon or is it going to be a while? Because I just had this, this this come up with the district like last week where, um, you know, they needed someone and the, the board dates weren't all lining up. It was too late, you know, because it has to come through us. But mm -hmm. this they would have been able to do it themselves had we known this. So I just wanted to know if that's coming really soon or is it going to be a while? And it currently is the practice. So if you send it in, my team is aware of that and they will not send it back if it's at the district level. But the actual um, yeah, information in a circular letter should come out very soon. It's going through the um, last levels of approvals. It's like I said, it was very thorough. So it was a little bit longer and it took a little time. So um, but if you do go ahead and send in those at the district level, they won't be turned away at this point. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I see no more raised hands. Okay, then go ahead and go on to the next slide. So I'm going to go ahead and update you on our Social Security Administrator team and um, updates on that. Next slide. So a few topics to discuss um, are annual air forms, the annual information request forms that go out, um, the annual maintenance fees and invoices, and school police positions. Next slide. So just a reminder that we are processing the annual information request forms. Currently, we are at a 55% response rate, and we would really appreciate if you could share with your districts um, that they really need to complete these and return them to us. We're trying to um, get that response rate up. Um, this is a very important step for all of us to ensure that proper reporting of Social Security and Medicare is done. The information collected assists the team with identifying problems early, earlier than later and assisting you with corrections or the district with corrections and proper reporting. If you need assistance completing this form, please let the team know and we can assist. Next slide. So uh, good news to note is that we will be extending the suspension of the annual maintenance fee invoices again this fiscal year. Next slide. So lastly, an update on school police. So the state social security administrator team received a question from a school police employee inquiring if their social security was being withheld appropriately. The team inquired to the social security administration regarding this and the response from the social security administrator administration, sorry, was that school police at the San Diego Community College should have social security contributions withheld. This is a reminder that social security coordination is by position, not by member category. Next slide, please. So San Diego Community College is being required to complete adjustments such as collecting social security taxes and updating W-2s for the past years so that the employee's social security benefits are accurate. If your school district has a similar situation with your school police, please contact the social security state administrator team to assist with reviewing and determining the correct path forward for your district. Um, please refer to circular letter 200-047-22 for more details. Next slide, please. So here are some resources on how to contact that team. There's a phone number you can call or an email, and there's the address. Next slide, please. So now I can open up for any questions. We have a raised hand. Go ahead, Deepa. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So my question is regarding the school um, safety purse and social security. We had an election for safety purse in 2017, and we were given the option during the election from Cal Purse that they can elect to have social security with safety purse or they can vote to have the safety purse with no social security. And our officers voted with no social security. And um, now am I understanding correctly that these officers are subject to social security, even though during the election, we were told by CalPERS that they have the option to not opt for social security along with safety perks. So first of all, can I ask what county you're with? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm with Sonoma County Junior College District. Okay. So it'll be Sonoma County Office of Education that does our reporting, but the governing board is the Sonoma County Office of Education, I mean, Sonoma County Junior College District. Okay, thank you very much for that information. Um, what we would suggest is that you do reach out to our team or I can have a team member reach out to you. It really does depend um, kind of, we need to look and see if your situation is similar. So we do need to look at a few different items to dis determine whether or not you would fall into that same um, path forward that the um, San Diego Community College is having to do. Okay, and who shall I contact regarding that? Because 
you know, this is really nerve wracking for us as a district since it's going, if it's going to go retroactive like San Diego City College back to 2017, um, it's a lot of money for the employees and the district, number one, to make all these corrections for social security. Um, and it's a negotiated item, so we have to take it to the collective bargaining agreement as well. So um, I had done, I had so much communications back and forth in 2017, um, and I actually even had to refund Social Security to police officers for six months because we took Social Security on overtime and um, any compensation that was paid to them that was not subject to CalPERS safety PERS. And we were told, nope, it's by employee. So if they are in safety PERS, then nothing has Social Security on it. And we were told to go back, make all these corrections, issued corrected W-2s to all of them. And now it's gonna be the same thing again, if that is the case. So can who can I talk to at CalPERS or for the social security, like directly talk to them so that we can get some resolution to this as soon as possible. So I'm going to, um get all of your information and have the manager, Veronica Silva Gill, reach out to you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions, Susan? It looks like we do. Um, um, Tammy, go ahead. Hi, Heather. Thank you for sharing. This is uh, Tammy Britt from the San Diego COE. And I just wanted to clarify that for the San Diego Community College, this was a separate CalPERS contract that they started with CalPERS for their school police. So I guess my question or comment is, was this something that should have been arranged from the beginning and was missed? In other words, does a contract unit work with your your department to coordinate social security and, and maybe deepa this applies to you if do you have a separate calpers contract for your police and and then in san diego there is an, another college that occasionally mentions beginning a school police separate contract but that never really gets off the ground so anyway that's my question and or comment Okay, so you stated that, right, so I am not sure what happened previously. I know that the way that this originated was due to an inquiry from a member, and so we did reach out to Social Security, the actual Social Security Administration, to get clarification on this matter, and what the circular letter um, that we did release shares is that direction that we received back. So I, I can't really answer for contracts, but um, this is how this originated and, and how we received this information back from the Social Security Administrator. Okay, thank you. Okay, and Deepa, um, looks like you have a follow-up question. Oh, I was just gonna respond to Tammy's question. Um, we did have a set, a separate safety purse contract with CalPERS for the sworn police officers. So it was a whole different contract that we had to negotiate with CalPERS to bring on safety purse for the sworn officers. Okay, any response? Okay. Then it looks like no more raised hands. Okay, then I guess I'll turn it back over to you, Susan. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, now is a good time to take our short break. Let's see, it's 1020. 
let's get back at 1037. 1037. Um, and just a reminder, we do have a trivia challenge, so have fun with that during break. And see you at 1037. All right, we're good. Um, so Megan, you have the floor. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I'm doing this at my desk, so it's the first time trying it out here. Um, and there is only one of me today, so any questions I will um, do at the end with any kind of chatting. So thank you so much in advance. <laughs> All right, so let's kick it off um, and go to the next slide with the MyCalPERS enhancements. We have made some enhancements to the arrears receivable detail report. We are making columns more dynamic, so not everything will display at all times. We're also clarifying some headers and rearranging some of the columns around just to make it more easily digestible. We've also shored up the permission sets associated to the report so that the proper people do in fact have access to it. Still, uh, similar in the arrears arena, there is now a payroll adjustment on completed arrears determinations form that will be going out um, at the end of next week that will start. And this is creating a new form so that if there are any adjustments on receivables for anything that has been completed, you will be aware of it. So pluses, minuses, previously there was no indication of this. And then the last bullet here, this is just a friendly reminder that the certification of certificated member report, um, it's picking up members that have less than a year of service credit, but only if they're employed by the school year for the entire year. So if you have a mid-year begin or end date, unfortunately, these members are excluded um, since they did not receive letters. Next slide, please. And this is, uh, we call this other enhancements because technically it is not for CalPERS members, but it is for the reciprocals, which you um, briefly heard about. Um, but this is just refreshing and automating some of the functionality within my CalPERS related to reciprocal systems. We are adding the ability to upload documents for requests um, along with additional employment information, um, making some enhancements to some of the panels from that um, reciprocal perspective, and then also creating some new panels as well. That's just a brief overview of it. Doesn't necessarily pertain to the CalPERS work um, that you guys are doing. Next slide, please. This is my favorite page, it's our reminders page. Um, so your reminder to use that undeliverable address Cognos report frequently. Um, we have been getting quite a bit of mail back, especially with people teleworking more often. Um, we are finding that people are not updating their address as much. So please take a look at this every now and then just to make sure that your employees' addresses are correct in our system. Um, and then we did make some security enhancements throughout the past year. This is a reminder to make sure that your access is correct for all of your employees. Um, ensure that you are separating people timely so that their access is terminated. And that for anybody who's a third party, um, if you are not setting up that um, business partner relationship, making sure to go in and terminate their access as well, just to really make sure we have our security on lock. Um, and then we have special contact types and some of our forms and notifications are specific to those contact types. So we really appreciate if you can make sure you have an arrears administrator, a financials contact, general, human resources, et cetera, for the primary contact for all of those. Now, one person can be designated as the primary contact for everything. Um, but like I said, not all of the forms that we have will just go to the general person. So we really do like to make sure that you have those um, solidified and identified in our system. And then my personal favorite reminder is please be working on your retirement appointment reconciliation and your reporting compliance. We are continuing to separate members for zero payroll after a period of six months or greater, unless they are on a leave of absence. So please go in and check those, make sure your members are being reported timely for all their payroll and their separations, et cetera. So that is the shortest systems enhancement presentation I think we've ever done. 
but we'll have more, I'm sure, to come in November. Um, next slide. And if we have any live questions, I can take those. Yeah, so far I see no raised hands. Oh, <laughs> wow. That could be a first two. Yeah, just wait for a little bit in case someone is trying to get on, but it doesn't look like it. Oh, okay, great. Well, if you have any questions, you want to type them in, I will be here to answer those as well. Thank you. And I'm going to pass it along, but I don't know who I'm passing along to. Oh, <laughs> Lindsay Dahl. Okay. I'll be Lindsay. Yes. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Megan. Uh, my name is Lindsay. I am an employer educator in RMI CalPERS Education and Training Unit. Today, I'm here to inform you about the education opportunities and resources that you have access to as a business partner with CalPERS. Next slide, please. Stay informed by receiving the latest updates that CalPERS has through our circular letters. Circular letters will update you of any changes in laws, processes, and procedures. All of our circular letters um, from 1996 to the current date are available on the CalPERS website. And you can get notified when there are new circular letters by subscribing to our employer bulletin. You can subscribe to the employer bulletin with your email address and you'll be provided with information directly about CalPERS news, updates, and upcoming events. This will give you personalized information based on your location, agency, and program type and most importantly, stay updated on upcoming education and training. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, we'll go over how to find, how to sign up for this on our CalPERS website. So this is a screenshot of the homepage and to subscribe to the employer bulletins or view any of our circular letters from the CalPERS website, you'll select the employers tab that is in red on the top of the page. Next slide. From there at the bottom in the middle, we have the resources column where you will then select circular letters. Next slide, please. And then under circular letters title, you'll find the employer bulletins link to subscribe. On this page, you can also access all circular letters since 1996 and use the search field to view the circular letters related to a topic or by the circular letter number. So from here, you would select employer bulletins highlighted in red Next slide, please. And then once you select the employer bulletin link on the right side of the screen, you have a box to enter in your email address. And then finally, you'll select the subscribe button. Next slide, please. Um, from this screen, you can select what email subscriptions you would like to receive. And then at the bottom, you'll select subscribe. If you're signing up for the employer bulletin, you'll be asked to provide your country, employer type, and job type, this will ensure that you, oh, you, you're gonna put in your county, not your country, sorry. You can put in your country if you want, but I meant county. And this will ensure that you are provided information that is relevant to your agency since it's based on location. Next slide, please. At no cost to you, we provide education and training opportunities for both business rules and the MyCalper system. Our business rules class provides employers with a foundational understanding of the laws and the rules associated with their agency's retirement or health contract. Our MyCalPERS trainings are offered to help you learn more about how to process transactions and navigate through MyCalPERS. Learn and master how to report retirement and health enrollments, run reports, process payroll, and make accurate payroll adjustments along with many other transactions through MyCalPERS. We offer both self-paced online classes and instructor-led classes to provide you with a higher level of understanding of CalPERS using tips, tricks, and practice with our system. There are different learning channels to match your learning style. Next slide, please. So our online classes provide steps on how to navigate through my CalPERS, perform transactions, and understand retirement and health business rules. These are self-directed, self-paced, and available to you online 24 seven at your own convenience. We also have our instructor-led classes. They're virtual and in-person. If you attend a virtual class, this is going to be a live presentation with one of our employer educators using your computer, regardless of where you're located. And then our in-person classes are hands-on interactive trainings offered at a CalPERS regional office. And here students receive logins to a training environment with fictitious data to follow along with this instructor during our practice scenarios. 
We offer resources that you can find on the CalPERS website to help you before and after you attend a class. These include our MyCalPERS student guides, our reference guides, and direct communication channels to help you find the answers to the questions that you might have. Next slide, please. We also offer specials. Uh, specials give us the opportunity to work with you on a flexible schedule per agency request. And then you can let us know how and when you would like to receive a training class. Employer educators will, will work with your agency schedule to provide you either MyCalPERS system or business rules training. And you can always reach out to us via email. Our team is the MyCalPERS Employer Education and Training Unit, which in the um, email will be linked at the end of this presentation. Next slide. So to find those resources that I just mentioned, um, back screenshots from the website, you are landed on the CalPERS homepage and you'll select that employers tab located at the top of the bar again. Next slide. Um, from here under the I want to section, you'll select attend trainings and events. Next slide. And then you'll scroll down on the employer education page until you find the classes and workshops section. So next slide, please. And you'll find a employer training classes link. This is gonna provide descriptions of the employer classes we offer. Um, so once you select the classes link for business rules and my CalPERS, you'll see the list of descriptions for all classes. Next slide, please. Our business rules and my CalPERS classes will be listed on this page that you see here as you scroll down the page. Next slide, please. You can also from the same page access our MyCalPERS student guide by selecting the link in the red box shown here. Next slide. And this is our student guides and resources page. So our student guides provide step-by-step -step processes to help you navigate and report information through MyCalPERS. These student guides are frequently updated to provide current and accurate information on the MyCalPERS processes and procedures. Next slide. And if you notice on the right side, there is a gray resources box where you can find the link to the reference and health guides. The reference and health guides are designed to help you in your business and health transactions with CalPERS. This page holds links to our reference guides, health benefits guides, and our retirement resource guides, which give further details behind CalPERS laws, rules, and processes. Finally, the last thing I want to show you in the website is going to be the MyCalPERS login button located at the top right. This will take you to the MyCalPERS login screen where you can use the education tab to sign up for any online classes or instructor-led classes I previously talked about today. Next slide. As educators, we're here to help you and we wanna help you in any way possible to make your job easier and our system more understandable. You can reach out to us via email for all of your business rules and MyCalPERS training needs. If you need clarification on a policy or a system procedure, or you just wanna get pointed in the right direction when seeking answers. This is gonna be the same email that you can also use to um, request a special. Once again, those can be virtual or in person. And that's when we work with you and your agency directly to get training that you need. Um, are there any questions that concludes my presentation, but I will take any questions live or in the chat. We have no live, whoops, yes we do. Okay, perfect. Go ahead, Ramona. I'm going to voice um, Jennifer's question about a good training to view um, how to use Cognos and what all of the um, different reports that you can select, what would be a good a good tool for that? So we have our employer uh, Cognos class, actually. It's typically offered on Thursdays, and it'll be either virtual or in-person if you're looking for a more hands-on interactive class or just the live presentation. Um, you can find that description on the website as well, and then sign up through the education tab. But there is a class that's directly for Cognos, which is nice because it's one of those that is a little bit tricky since it's outside of the MyCalPERS system. But once you get the tips and tricks of it, it's a pretty handy class for sure. And the catalog is also on our website for what reports 
you um, want to run or should be running with descriptions of each report as well under the system enhancements page. Um, from there, you can select the Cognos catalog for all um, report descriptions. Okay, I don't see. Oh, yes, we do. Hold on just a second. Go ahead, Jennifer. Um, is there any way that you could put a link to all that um, in the chat so that we can have we can um, actually go into it based on what you're saying? Definitely. Um, I went ahead and put the CalPERS employer communications um, email in there. Um, and then I can put the link in the chat as well, just so that you have that um, reports page with the catalog and then our um, classes as well. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. They're in the chat. Oh, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other raised hands. Okay, well, if there are any more questions or you guys want more one on one training, definitely reach out to our email business rules and my CalPERS system training has constant access to this email so we're more than happy to help. Um, if there's no more questions or they're coming in the chat later, I will log off for now and pass the mic over to Josh. All right, thank you, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's a long time uh, since I've done a SEAC and hosted them, so I'm glad that it's in good hands over with Susan's team. Um, I'm just here to give a real quick update on the uh, educational forum coming up here in a couple of months, so next slide, please. So we are going to be doing our first in-person educational forum in, uh, in a couple of years. So we're going to be doing it live in person, November 1st through 3rd. That will be a Tuesday through Thursday this year. So not to be confused with the prior Wednesday, uh, Monday through Wednesday schedule uh, down in Anaheim. So uh, there will be plenty of access to Disneyland right down the street. Uh, for those of you who have not really ever attended the educational forums, these are great um, opportunities to come and get just you know, top-notch education from our subject matter experts, get some one-on-one -on -one time with, uh, you know, all the people in our booths, go to all sorts of different sessions. Um, like I said, it will be about a three-day session. So, um, you know, there's plenty of material to be had um, and all levels of the CalPERS are going to be down there. We send like 200 people down to make sure that this is a top-notch event. Um, next uh, slide, please. Oh, and that's that's basically it for me. So um, registration is currently open. The link is in the uh, in the chat box. So if there's any other questions for me, there are no raised hands right now. All right, then I will toss it back over to you, Susan. Great. Okay. Thank you, Josh. So at this time. Um, Brad and Christina and the rest of our panelists are available to answer your questions. Please submit your questions using either the Q&A feature or select the raised hand icon at the bottom of your screen. So um, we do have a raised hand right now. So I'll go and ask Tina to go ahead. I have to unmute myself. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I have a question. I would like to circle back to the pay rate. Um, okay. The first few uh, slides. Okay. So um, that one of the slides are talking about full time service credit. Um, then uh, it uh, is it um, like list like ten months. Um, if the full time service credit. Um, when Can you go to that slide, Susan, so we can see what she's talking about? Yeah, was that the pay rate slide? Um, uh, yes, I can pull it up. It's a slide nine, I believe. Yeah, I, I have on my nine, but I'm not sure. One more, one more. One more, yes. That one. Yeah, here you go. You see full time survey credit 10 months? Correct. Okay, so for that, I have a little bit um, um problem to understand. The 10 months, uh, if, if someone work for 10 months, is this um, equivalent to the four year survey credit that you find like 1.0 per year? Uh, 
You know, it really depends. So if you're working part time during those 10 months, no, you will not earn a full year. If you're okay. working, if you work basically 172 hours in a per month for 10 months, then you will receive the full time service credit. Okay. So, that, so, that, so basically in a full fiscal year, you have an opportunity to earn 1,720 hours that will count towards your service credit. Anything below that, you get less than a year. Okay, because based on the way that we calculate the monthly pay rate, uh, in order for us to calculate the monthly pay rate correctly, um, so like for example, example we go we went over before that um, the correct pay rate is twelve thousand three hundred twenty five dollar ninety three cent instead of uh, ten thousand. So for that pay rate. Um, in order for a member to earn a full one point of service credit per year, they have to work for 12 months. So if we, we say 10 months, so if they work only 10 months, then they only earn about 0.8 service credit. So in that case, if they work only 10 months, is it considered full-time service credit? No, it would not. It not, would, yeah. It, it would, yeah, it would. If you would, um, whoever's running the slide deck, um, go forward to two slides. Um, is this one the more, right? one, one more, one more. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly like in this scenario, right? Even at 12 months, the person didn't get a full year. They got 0. 0.9732. Yeah. But that's, that, that's one of the issues with this pay rate issue. Like if you match a period to earnings, the person will get more service credit than they're entitled to. Right. So that's why you have to report the pay rate at 40 and then the earnings as they're truly earned. So, but in the in, at, at the end of the day, it actually had, it's more of an advantage to the member I to see. do it this way. They get less service credit. However, their final comp has increased. So it kind of comes out in the wash that they get what they're supposed to. I got um, it. Yes. Yep. OK. Yeah. The only thing I got some question from the district employee and say, oh, you guys say um, only 10 months that I've earned for your silver credit. And I look at the pay rate, I say, no, you have to work right based yep. on your contract promise. So the question must say, why on the regulation say 10 months? So yeah. I just want to make sure that I understand fully. OK. You know, and I'm you. glad you bring that up. On the you know because I use these slides quite often, I'll adjust my slides to make that more clear. Ten full time months, right? It's is a full year, not part time months. Correct. Yes, correct. Okay, thank right. you. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other raised hands right now. Um, let's give it another. Yeah. No. Can I? Oh, no, a lot came up just now. <laughs> oh, never mind. I, I was going to make a plug for something, but okay, oh. let's, let's, we'll go for the questions first. Okay, let's see. It looks like Jesse is first. Go ahead, Jesse. Hi. Yeah, I have a question. Is there any difference for less than full time employees if we don't report the monthly pay rate and we use an hourly, the associated hourly rate? As um, Red as, as long as your hourly is based on a 40 hour equivalent, our system will automatically convert it to the 40 for you. So there's no loss or gain by doing so. Nope. If you report hourly, daily, or monthly, as long as it's based on 40, it should all come out with the true monthly pay rate, which we use to calculate the final comp. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Um, next, looks like it's Monica. Go ahead, Monica. Monica, it looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Awesome. I have to unmute in two places. So now I know. <laughs> okay. Um, so hi, everybody. Hi, Brad. Um, I kind of have a suggestion, if um, if at all possible, in the future. What confuses me on, on the sample on, um, I have slide 10. I think it might be your slide 11. You're using 7.5 hours. Um, if you might change that to eight hours, in my opinion, for me, it would be much easier to follow because okay. for schools, at least the majority of the classified people will be working the eight hours. You know, if they're working full time, even though they're only working for the 225 days, they're still working that full eight hours a day. And if we change that, then it should change their service credit to, um, 
1.0 because they're working the full eight hours a day for those 225 days. At least I think that's what the math will turn out to be. But okay. anyway, that because when I've seen this before and that 7.5 always throws me, you know, right. I, I, I just can't wrap my head around it because nobody I know works 7.5 right. hours as a full time. So I was just going to I just wanted okay. to bring that up and see if that might work for you. Sure. You know, I'll take that suggestion um, and, and we'll all to the size next time. Maybe we'll give an example of a seven and an eight. We actually do sometimes see six and a half, seven and a half considered full time. But that's a good point. You know, maybe give a more um, co common example. of eight. That, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Yep. Okay. Um, next up is Debbie. Go ahead, Debbie. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, my question is, has to do with like a person who works 12 months, seven and a half hours a day, full time in that position. It's a county office. We're allowed to work seven and a half. They would still not earn a full year service credit or would they still earn the full year service credit at 10 months, um, even with seven and a half hours a day? Yeah. So per our example, it looks like they would come up just a little bit short about, you know, um, I forget what, can you go back to my slide again, Susan? Yeah, a slide 11, I think. The, the one that's called correct example. Okay. Um, Keep going, I think. That one. Yeah. So you can see that's the, exactly what we did in this scenario here. And the person was earning 0.811 per month. So at the end of the year, they're going to come up slightly short um, but, 10, but 10 months and 17 20 hours is full time so why would they not receive their full year service credit and have actually earned more than the because, full year so the pay rate needs to be based on 40 whereas your pay as your earnings are based on 7.5 yes so but they go over 12 10 months and over 17 20 hours well if you would send me that example and I'll work the math out. I don't, I, I, that's one of those things I just would have to see it to, to show you. Okay. Thank you. I mean, yeah, you're right. If they, if they worked 1,720 hours in a 12 month period, you're correct. They should get the full service credit. Maybe my example here, I just, it, it's not exactly one for one on the 7.5, but yeah, in essence, you have 12 months to work the 1,720 hours. As long as that out, those hours are met within the calendar year, you should get the full year of service credit. Okay. And if we report there, let's say they get $20 an hour and they work 37 and a half hours a week and we report them at the $20 an hour, would they not be earning? We don't have to change their pay rate to something else because to make it 40 hours, do we? No, the pay rate always needs to be based on 40. For CalPERS, we always base but our it's, final. We're, we're reporting it hourly. As long as the hourly was converted using a 40 hour conversion, then you're okay. Like if you go back two, three slides, Susan. Mm -hmm. um, one more, please. Um, okay, go back. Sorry. Uh, hold on. It's the one that says pay rate reporting one of three, this one, right? So so this is basically how you would need to convert your pay rates in order to base it off of, of the true amount. And so once you, you do this, right, they work 225 days, 7.5 hours per day, their so annual earnings is 120,000. So to get the daily earnings, you divide that by the total day's work that gives you your, per, your daily rate. And then you divide the daily by the two hours work that comes up with the hourly pay rate. So now if you go forward two slides, Susan. Mm -hmm. Next one. So then here you have your true pay rate based on the 7.5. But now we need you to take that true pay rate and convert it as if they're 40. And that gives you your full time. So that's where your earnings are. So as you see here, the earnings 154, you really never paid them. Right. But that's what we need the pay rate to be based on is if they had worked 40. So now you have your pay rate based on if it was 40, even though that's not what they truly were paid, but then your earnings reflect the true earnings they worked. So in situations like that, they might have got their whole $150,000 worth of earnings, but because of this pay rate issue, they won't get that full service credit. 
But it, like I said earlier, it kind of comes out in the wash because now their pay rate is going to be higher than what it truly was. Their service credit might be lower, but then at the end of the day, the calculation comes out to what it truly should be, which in most cases is higher than what it should be. Okay, but you're taking an annual and converting it down to an hourly and then multiplying it up to the 40 hours a week pay rate. I'm asking if a person's being reported at an hourly rate, that's what they're hired at, not a contract, not management, but 40 hours of uh, $20 an hour, it's my mm -hmm. example, and they only work 37 and a half because that is full time at this county office, then will I be reporting them at $20 an hour for their earnings still, or do I have to somehow inflate the $20 to or actually it'd be deflating because I would take take the 37 divided times 20 and divided by 40 would make their pay rate a lower pay rate. I think I actually would increase it, but um, you know, basically you have to figure out how you did you derive that hourly pay rate. The hourly pay rate at the end of the day has to go back to what we consider 40 hour pay rate. So the hour, you can report an hourly, but at the end of the day, our system, we're going to always convert you as if you're 40. So 173.333. So if you give us an hourly that's based on 37.5, we're going to incorrectly convert it to a lower monthly pay rate. At the end of the okay, day, but, yeah. But that's, you're saying we're converting the pay rate to 40, but actually, well, what I'm asking is they only work 37 and a half at $20 an hour. They were hired at $20 and they're not going to be paid a different pay rate. And if I report them at the 1875 for my example, then they're actually going to be thinking they're not being paid fully because they're contracted for $20 per hour. Why um, would we, wouldn't your machine just say, okay, they take the 20 times the 40, show that they would earn more in pay rate, but potential for full-time and have less earnings, right? But if I change the pay rate, the pay rate they're hired on is $20 an hour. Why would I change that? Well, you the, so, um, you know, it's very complex to understand for me without seeing it on paper. Okay. So if you would submit your question to yes. me and we will prove out the math for you, perhaps you're correct, but the way that only way I can explain this is, is that your pay rate always has to come back to the root of being based off of 40. The earnings are what they truly earned, right? So you report the earnings, what they truly were paid. The pay rate, however, will be inflated. If it's less, if you're not really working 40, working 37.5, we need to go back to that root of converting it down to the proper hourly so that it converts properly at 40. And Which I just did, and it shows it at $18.75 when there's contract to earn $20 an hour. Well, perhaps then the 20 was inflated higher than it should have been. No, the 20 was their actual contract pay, the, yeah. the amount they were hired to be paid per hour. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go but ahead yes, and, I can fix something. Yeah. Wait. I have a person here trying to work the math. Ah. And, and I and I know that how we have it is correct, but I can't explain it without okay. seeing it. I'm sorry. Yeah. I like to see the numbers too. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's see. We have oh, Faith went away. Faith was there. Let's go back up to Deepa then. Go ahead, Deepa. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on something that was discussed at the last employer advisory meeting, and it had to do with special comp um, earned in the final year before retirement. Um, and the fact that it would not be counted if it was only for one year. Um, can, can, can you just explain that to me? Is that, is that in place now so that, for example, if I were to get a longevity increase this July or September because of the way the contract is negotiated, and I retire at the end of the fiscal year in June, would the longevity that I receive based on an MOU and my years of service at the district not count in my final call? Um, yeah, that's correct. So we have it within the government code 
uh, basically that um, that special comp cannot be reported solely in the final comp period. So if you happen to, by circumstance, let's say you that the district just contracts for longevity pay effect, effective 1-1-2022, one, one, and you start receiving it, and then you retire at 12-31-2022, so you work the full 12 months, you receive longevity pay out 12 of those months, we would not include that in your final comp calculation because it's solely in the final comp period. Um, it, it creates a funding issue if the member hasn't paid more than just that one full fiscal year. So yes, we would deny in a situation like that. And what if it was already in agreement, like the contract already provides for it, like after 10 years, you get longevity. Yeah. And I'm in my 10th year now, so I got longevity and then I retire at the end of the year. So it's not something new that the district negotiated, it's already in place. So Regar that's one example. Yeah, and regardless then, regardless of how long it's been in the MOU or contract, it doesn't matter. No matter what special comp type it is, off salary, schedule pay, longevity pay, any of them, if it's solely in the final comp period, we will deny it. Okay, but if it's consistent, for example, if I was getting 5% longevity pay and then after 15 years, it changes to 10% and because of the way the MOU is, and then if I retire at the end of the year that I get my 10%, would only the years with the 5% be counted towards final comp? Nope. Okay, okay, so in that situation, you it's not solely in the final comp period. It doesn't really matter what the percentages is, what the dollars is. We just have to see that you had that longevity pay reported for greater than 12 months. Okay. So yeah, that's a great question. At the end of the day, no, we don't look at the amounts. We just see, hey, one, is it compliant with the MOU? You know, is is it, are they reporting it correctly? And then two, is it solely in final comp? So in this case, no, it doesn't matter if you had a 5%, then 10%, then a 15%, we are just going to see, was it in there for longer than a year? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and Tina. Yes. Um, you know, like previous, um, um, you know, you guys talking about uh, the audit, that find out that a majority of school um, report the pay rate incorrectly. Um, I, and I'm pretty much sure that uh, will be fall on my county as well. So um, so the this CalPERS have any, um, you know, like solution for that? Because if right now they find out that School school district report the pay rate for many years incorrectly. So, what is the best way to correct it? Could you repeat that question? I don't know if I was following that. You know, like the pay rate, like um, we, you know, like the correct way, like one of the examples that we come back a couple of times, the correct way is, um, I mean, the correct pay rate would be 12325 but most of the majority of district, they um, report at $10,000 per month. Right. So when CalPER find out the issue that the school district um, report pay rate incorrectly, so what is the best solution? That mean, how CalPER success the school district to correct it? Yeah. So, you know, the solution would be that we would have you update your public way available pay schedule to reflect the true, or I should say the the 40 hour equivalent pay rates, right? And then we would have you go back to fix at least back to um, your record retention policy. So if you have a record retention, say of five years, we would go back at least five years because you might not have records prior to that. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we have that duty to correct. So we have to ensure that the members are truly getting what they're supposed to. And then additionally, all those payroll records for every member that was impacted, we would have to have you correct all of those as well. So the earnings probably would remain the same. However, the pay rates then would have to be increased and based on the 40. I see. And you know, um, Brad, I, I, uh, when I look at the way that CalPO calculate um, the survey credit and um, on the page, 
um, that you come up with uh, point one per month for service credit. Mm -hmm. If you have ten thousand dollar per month and you divide for ten thousand, you come up with point one per month. Correct. And that's why you say if the person work for twelve months, then they going to earn one point two service credit, uh, which is over the one point. I mean, depend on how you want to calculate it. But I know that counselor, they calculate the survey credit by the using the earning per month and divide for the annual salary, uh -huh. then they will not have any this issue. And then district doesn't need to convert the hour the, the inflate rate, like monthly pay rate that CalPERS expect it to be. Because like Cowper want to have 40 hour um, per week is a full time and want to convert uh -huh. the monthly pay rate that the district wanna high at 10,000, go up to 12,000 something. That not the pay rate that the district pay the employee. So, you know, like the county office district, they use the same payroll system. District will not be able to enter the monthly pay rate that district did not have in the contract to hire the employee because they hire $10,000 per month, not 12,000 something per month. Uh -huh. So if Cowper, you know, like change the way that you calculate the survey credit by using the earning per month divide for annual pay rate, the district doesn't need to use the back pay rate that they did not hire the employee for and everything for in the correct direction and no need of the correction. That's what my point. Yeah. Well, you know, we're governed under different laws than CalSTRS and to make any of those changes, it would take a change of that government code 20636.1 and of our service credit law as well. So it's not just we it's not just a reporting method. It's actually being compliant with the law that we require this. Type I of understand, but you know, the calculation there, for example, if you took the silver credit ten thousand over uh, divide for ten thousand per month, you earn point one per month. Right. If you take ten thousand and you divide for hundred twenty thousand, you come up with a salary point eighty three. And if that person worked for twelve months, then they earn a sadly one year of credit. I mean, the law is one thing, but the calculation math is math. One will plan equal two. I mean, I mean, like if we do, we approach to the correct way, it will make everything easy for everyone. I mean, I would love to just make it easy for everyone. Unfortunately, though, this is you know th this is what the law is, and this is how we require the reform to be. Unfortunately. Thank you. I just want to bring my point. No, I get so, it. I blame me. I've gone over this over and over again. And and um, it, it doesn't, it, you know, it, the law doesn't kind of, it, it is kind of odd, right? You're well, basically, I, we're I telling you, we're telling you to inflate the period at 40 and they never really paid that. And if you do they the no, earnings, no it's one less, wanted, right? No one want to inflate the rate because that's right. not what they want to, they pay employee. So right. but they what create you pay, something. Well, you pay should be reflected in the earnings, right? So the earnings will be correct. It's just that pay rate will truly be. I understand, yeah, yeah okay. but that the pay rate is what district intend to hire the employee. Right. So they need to, to, to use it correctly. Right. Well, yeah. I, you heard my answer per the government. Yeah, I no, heard that's you. how it I, should work. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. yeah, I just want to bring up the issue and then hopefully couple can look into that and, you know, you know, move in the direction that easy for everyone. Right. No, I, I understand. Yes, thank you. Okay, I do not see any other raised hands right now. How did I get off with no questions? That's totally shocking. I can't believe it. Oh, no. Well, we might have spoke too soon. Ramona, okay. go ahead, Ramona. So, Brad. I, just answering on Angela Casey's question about the 37 and a half hours a week, not getting the full year of service, even though it's over 52 weeks, it wouldn't take the 39,000 divided by the 41,600 to come up with the service credit. It would take each month's amount and the employee would get um, close to that 
full amount and then you multiply that over the 12 months, they, they would end up with the full year service credit. So that question or? You... Yes, people seem to be struggling with the the working the minimum and whether or not they would get a full year of service credit. Right. They're going to get their full year of service credit. They have a partial month for all 12 months. Right. This partial month are added together. In her case, with the 52 weeks of 37 and a half hours, they will get a full year of service credit. But I think that they wouldn't because of the way that the pay rate needs to be converted. So they, at the end of the day, it won't appear they're working full time because we're bumping that pay rate up to 40, not based off the 37 and a half. Right, but when you have that 0 0.09 whatever, and you multiply it by 12 months, you cap out at a 1.0. You know, again, um, if you have any detailed questions like this to calculate service credit, please send them to me. I don't wanna answer these on the fly. I know that we've been through these scenarios when we created these PowerPoints. And, and in reality, if they're not working the eight hours, then they should not be getting the full service credit. Um, you know, I, I, I don't wanna just answer things. And I have people messaging me on the side, like four people trying to help me with the question, but I don't wanna get it wrong because I'm getting different responding. And so I appreciate everyone trying to help, but it's just confusing matters. So, you know, at the end of the day, if you have any detailed questions on how your pay rate should be reported and the corresponding service credit, Please email them. You can email them directly to me. You can send them to the MOU mailbox and we will do the math and show you what we mean on this. I don't want to just speak off the fly. I have my example on here and that's how that should work out. Um, however, these other ones, I need to sit down and do it to give you the right answer. And Brad, that email is MOU underscore? Un underscore review at calpers.ca.gov. Thank you. Okay, Lisa. Hi, it's actually Lisa Marie. Oh, Lisa I just Marie. wanted to say, Brad, kudos to you. you. You're doing a really good job and I just wanna acknowledge you. Well, thank you very much. And I'm sorry if I'm coming across as if I, you know, I'm frustrated. It's not that I'm frustrated. It's just like, I don't want to lead anyone astray. Um, you know, we've had numerous audits on this. And I know that the issue normally is, is that you're converting the pay rate out of 40. So it bumps it up to higher than it was. But then if your earnings are based on 37 and a half, you're not getting full-time service, right? So that's where the rub comes. So, you know, I understand that you guys are running the math equations as well. I'm sure there's just something that is being left out, but that's why I'm just asking if you could please send them to me, we'll, we'll show you a better example. And I really appreciate that, Lisa. I, you know, I try my best to try to answer all these questions on the fly. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, we have Teresa. Go ahead, Teresa. No. Oh. Oh, Teresa went away. Okay. Ramona, do you have another question? Or is that a one no, one. is my hand still up? Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. Okay. Okay, then it looks, oh, don't we have? Teresa? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, apologies. Um, so I think my mind got a little blown on the, um, <laughs> longevity of, you know, special comp. So if I understand correctly, you're saying if somebody has um, a 10 year longevity, let's say, and they get a 4%, you know, additional, and then, um, and then they step up and they get um, a 15 year longevity. So now they're at eight point something because it's cumulative. Um, if they earn their longevity in the very last year, if they get that bump up um, and 
you're saying that that the the second to the last year may actually be their highest year because we're not considering that bump up to eight percent. No, you know, basically what I was what I was trying to convey was, you know, we have this within the regulation, we have uh, it, it states that you know, special comp can't be reported solely in the final comp. So, for instance, if you have a 12 month final comp and you only receive longevity pay for 12 months and that's in your final comp period, we'll deny that. However, regardless of, you know, if you have several steps within your longevity, you know, after 10 years, you get 5 percent, after 15 percent, you get 10, 15 years, you get 10 percent, so on and so on. All we're going to look at is, did you receive longevity pay? doesn't really matter what the dollar amount is um, when it comes to the solely and final comp, but if you had it for greater than 12 months or greater than 36 months, if you have a three-year final comp, we're, we, we will allow that as long as it meets all the standards that we need for in the MOU. You know, is it available to the entire per group, group or class? Is it not just for top step? Um, things of that nature. Those are things we could deny. But as long as it's not solely in the final comp period, we will not deny it. Okay, so if it is, um, let's pretend it is somebody who reached their 10 year, their first a longevity step, um, and it is in their last, then that longevity, the special comp would not be considered um, for that year. So it'd just be the base pay, basically. That's gonna be their final. Correct. Comp. So okay. you work for the school for 10 years, and after mm -hmm. the 10th year, you get your longevity, and then you retire on the, well, on the eleventh year, and it's yeah. solely in that final comp period. Yes, we would deny it, regardless if it was compliant in the MOU. And and then what about if it was like thirteen months, fourteen, like like how and many? Months? As long as it goes beyond the final comp period, it's compliant. Okay, so thirteen months, then then they'll consider that longevity, that longevity period. Correct. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. That's it for our raised hands. Um, Christina, do you have anything to add before we end the I webinar? I wish there would have been a question for me to give Brad a break, but Brad did a great job. Thanks. Yes, you did, Brad. Thanks. All right, then. So if you have any more questions after the webinar ends, feel free to email those to the CalPERS SIAC uh, mailbox, and that one is CalPERS underscore SIAC at calpers.ca.gov. Yeah, and please, if you have any questions on how to convert the pay rates for the service, I, I meant it, please send it in and we can provide you back the example. Okay, I did post your email as well as the MOU, MOU review mailbox. So okay. In there for them. Thank you. Yeah. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that we will send a report out after um, the webinar that shows all the questions and the answers that were submitted. And uh, don't forget the survey that comes out is, um, as soon as you log off. And we encourage you to complete that and submit the survey. Um, we do want to thank our presentation team, especially Brad, for passing along their valuable information. And a big thank you to you, our school employers, for all your questions and comments. As a reminder, Cal Sturs will be hosting the afternoon session of the Employer Advisory Committee meeting at 1230. And you can log on to the CalSTRS website um, to join their meeting. So again, thank you so much for your time today and have a great afternoon.